and I guess you must confirm that that you you not you your cons consent with with the recording, right? Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the very first talk of the Refi lecture series that just started today, again, after more than two years of a break where nothing happened, not only at Refi, but uh, in many places of the world. So we take it on again. And I will give the word to Robert to say a few things about this lecture series. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm very happy to welcome you. My name is Robert Trappel. I have the honor and pleasure of being head of the Austrian Research Institute for AI and a great team at OFI worked laboriously many weeks to find the best speakers of so interesting topics worldwide that um, I think you have been astonished to see this list and I wholeheartedly welcome you. What you will hear today is a most interesting presentation of an extremely hot topic, namely an inequality. And the talk is entitled Domesticating Wealth Inequality, Hybrid Discourse Analysis of United Nations General Assembly Speeches, between 1971 and 2018. And the speaker is uh, Scott Robert Patterson. And quite evidently, I don't will drop his second name. Um, and uh, he is a PhD candidate in political science at McGill University in Montreal in Canada. The training he got uh, was partially here in Vienna, namely in natural language processing at the OFA Language Technology Lab. And in addition, he studied at the Austrian Diplomatic Academy and obtained a master's degree of advanced international studies. So it's a great pleasure to welcome him here, Scott, and please, the floor is open to you. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh... Yes, I, I enabled uh, screen sharing, so I think you can just start, Scott. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation to, to present my work. Um, many of you here have helped me with this work uh, at an earlier time, especially Brigitte and Friedrich, who taught me the basics of, of language processing, and also uh, Professor Kornpropst here, who uh, who uh, took me on as a research assistant to work on the same data set, but uh, for, a different, for a different type of project. Um, so get started. My, my name is again, Scott Patterson. I'm a PhD student in international relations. Um, and my research interest is really on the intersection of international relations and machine learning. Um, and that's really in two separate ways. Um, my dissertation project focuses on sort of the geopolitics of the AI industry and how states compete against each other through that industry. Um, and then I also use machine learning as a research method, uh, especially with, uh, with computational text analysis. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen now.
see. Okay. So this project is called uh, Domesticated. Can, can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay. So this project is called um, Domesticating Wealth Inequality. And uh, it's a project I've been working on with my supervisor, Vincent Pilliard, for about the last two years. Um, uh, and so uh, recent years have seen a, a surge of interest in, in wealth inequality. Um, in this study, we use machine learning text analysis to study the evolution of diplomatic debates about international wealth inequality. Um, and so our primary substantive finding is that uh, we find that the range of potential solutions uh, through which wealth inequality can be addressed has decreased over time or is constricted over time. Uh, while meanwhile, wealth inequality itself appears to be becoming a more serious issue. So there's a puzzle there. Um, and on a more technical level, we illustrate how pre-trained word embedding language models uh, can be used for discourse analysis. Um, so for this presentation today, I'll begin with a, a substantive background and go over our, our political findings. Uh, then I'll move into a technical discussion of word embedding models. I'll add some, uh, some of the strengths and limitations of this study and I'll identify some, some further avenues for research. So the substantive background, um, really, again, recent years have seen a surge of interest in wealth inequality. Um, economists offer many different perspectives uh, on this issue, but many seem to think that it's getting worse. Um, and I think we can see a lot of evidence for this in ongoing debates about rising costs of living, uh, and uh, that have followed from some of the events of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and many political scientists are interested in some of the consequences of wealth inequality, such as the rise of, uh, of extremist parties in the wake of economic dislocation, or um, some of the recent attention that's been brought to offshoring and dark money uh, in, the, in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, Wealth inequality is a pressing issue and many politicians feel a need to speak about it. This includes domestic politicians as well as international politicians such as diplomats and we're much more interested in the latter. So to begin, we construct, uh, we identify two sort of ideal type narratives uh, through which diplomats discuss or, or international politicians discuss wealth inequality. Um, and this involves the construction of wealth inequality as a problem, as well as uh, potential solutions through which it could be, could be resolved. Um, we call the first an order consistent approach. And this tends to emphasize that, um, uh, that economic growth is a prior condition for economic equality. Uh, so inequality that is produced by economic growth will eventually even out over time. And so states should prioritize growth in the near future. Um, and many proponents of this approach would look to countries like China and India and say, uh, these countries have been remarkably successful at lifting many, many people out of poverty. Um, and they've done so largely by, uh, by integrating into, into uh, globalized economy. Now the order challenging perspective uh, tends to argue that wealth inequalities reflect um, some prior colonial uh, history or path of, of exploitation. Um, and without international uh, intervention or redistribution, inequality is likely to get worse over time. And while China and India have, uh, again, lifted many people out of poverty, um, those are two countries. Most other countries uh, still remain, uh, many, many countries remain poor. Uh, and also China and India have their own internal, uh, internal inequality problems. So for a little historical context, um, during the early or during the 1970s and even into the early 1980s, there was an eclectic mix of these, uh, of these narratives and diplomatic debate. Um, in fact, in the, in the 1970s, um, order challenging rhetoric was actually far more prevalent than order uh, consistent rhetoric. Um, but today this order challenging rhetoric has essentially disappeared. Um, and so 
I pose this rhetorical question, is that because international wealth inequality has been solved? I think probably nobody would say that, yet discursively, it would appear that uh, this is the case. And so this is the puzzle from which we depart. How can it be that order challenging rhetoric has collapsed at a time when wealth inequality itself has actually increased? So the main argument of our piece is that international wealth inequality has been rhetorically domesticated in venues of diplomatic debate. We mean this in two separate ways. Um, one way is domesticated as in downplayed or um, made less serious. Uh, so this, that's, uh, it's essentially kind of saying that wealth inequality is not that serious of a problem or it will resolve on its own over time. Um, and the second perspective holds that uh, wealth inequality is a domestic issue, meaning that it's something for national governments to solve. Uh, so the problem itself is not something taking place at the international level, but rather it's an issue for countries to solve internally. And neither of these permit much uh, uh, room for, for redistribution or, or sort of international efforts to, to address this. So and this is something that I'll get to later as we as I show some of our empirical results, but today most states actually speak a domesticated discourse on, on wealth inequality. Um, and what's remarkable is this trend is consistent across multiple levels of economic development. So you have countries that are very poor who are, who are speaking in a very similar way to countries that are very rich. Uh, and it's also very consistent across geography with a slight exception of Latin America, but this is very, very slight. Um, and so we argue overall that this has kind of shrunk the Overton window in a way of potential ways in which uh, inequality can, can be dealt with. Okay, so moving on to, to the more technical elements. The data set that we use is called the United Nations General Debate Corpus. Um, it, is, uh, it includes 8,093 speeches, uh, and it includes all of the United Nations General Assembly for, floor speeches from 1971 through 2018. Um, it's updated yearly, so I believe now they're up through 2020. Um, and all of the speeches are labeled as a state and a year. Um, so this is actually useful because it allows for you to pool groups of, of speeches together so from, from state and year, you can construct other metadata categories, such as the UN region, or if a, if a country is a member of the United Nations Security Council. And that allows for some creative pooling of the, of the corpus. Um, and so this is, a, in some ways, I've been working with this, for, this data set for a long time. In some ways, it feels like there's almost an arms race right now to come up with like the master narrative of this. Uh, and, um, so in some ways that's a benefit because you see there's a lot of different people working on it and there's a lot of creative approaches to it. It's kind of like the sandbox where people from international relations try to learn how to do uh, text analysis. Um, and some of the other benefits are that it has this long time horizon. So you can see how trends evolve over time. Um, it's complete, it comes, you know, every state every year is giving one of these speeches and also, the event itself is really a central diplomatic event of the year. Um, so again, it's every, every year the head of state or the chief diplomat from every country kind of talks about uh, the problems that the world is facing and the position that their country uh, takes on them or, or stands within them. Um, now, there's also a lot of really unique challenges to working with this data set. And one of them is that it has a very topical focus. Uh, so, you know, our, our, our aim was to try to understand debates over economy. And when I was working with Professor Kornpopst, we were trying to figure out uh, security and, and nuclear weapons. Um, but so economy and security are these very abstract concepts. When diplomats actually speak about these issues, they don't really telegraph it and say, okay, uh, now I'm going to speak about security. These are our security priorities. Or when they talk about economy, or, or wealth inequality, they don't telegraph what it is they're going to say. You have to figure out what it is in a contextual, in a way that is sensitive to context. And, and so one example, in, in the mid 1980s, there was a, a debt crisis. Um, and uh, during this time, much of the debate over wealth inequality in these speeches centered on that debt crisis. 
And so if you wanted to, through a, a, like through a language model, figure that out, you couldn't just look for uh, in, like how many times is inequality mentioned in this year? The debate over inequality is centered on the debt crisis debate, but that's something that is time or temporally specific to the mid 1980s. And it's not the same words that are used to discuss inequality at, at other moments in time. Um, so anyway, the topical focus of that presents a, a distinct challenge. Um, and another issue is just some random noise and variation. Uh, like in 2014, the speech that was delivered by Viktor Orban from Hungary focuses on one environmental issue. Uh, it's something about pollution in the Danube, I think. But that was the entire speech. Um, and so I think from that, it would be difficult to uh, you know, argue that Hungary's main uh, political priority is, is uh, cleaning the Danube. Um, so it's kind of just a, it's a random, there's not a set form that these speeches need take. Um, and also Russia has issued several 30 second speeches that are just very, very short. Um, so there's, there's some random variation in them that can, that can be a challenge as well. Uh, there's also a lot of very floral language that is just kind of uh, nonsense, uh, <laughs> diplomatic nonsense. Um, okay, so our initial approach was to use latent Dirichlet allocation topic modeling. And we thought that we could use this to analyze the composition of economy topics. Now, latent Dirichlet allocation, this is, uh, I think, an older, uh, from, mach from, from machine learning experts, this may seem very old. For political science, it's probably the most commonly used approach for, for text analysis. And I believe there's a lot of commercial applications as well. Um, so despite not being at the cutting edge, it's very widely used. So I thought it would be useful to discuss a limitation that we discovered uh, in the course of, of trying to use this approach. Um, and so uh, our expectation was that rich countries would assert, um, would assert this order consistent rhetoric and that other countries or poorer countries would oppose it. And we would see this nice kind of polarization appear that would be consistent throughout time. And it turns out that we were very wrong in that, both in our method and in our substance. Um, and so with methods, I think this points out one of the real issues of bag of words models and other counting methods for, for language processing. Um, just briefly, bag of words is a, is a <coughs> technique for discourse analysis or for, for um, text analysis. Uh, and it basically treats every document in a corpus as a mixture of words. And uh, the reason it's called a bag of words is because the order of the words doesn't appear or is not important. What's important is the, the word frequency counts. Um, and so for our task of conducting discourse analysis that is sensitive, uh, we need something that is more sensitive to, to context. Uh, and you know, to address this debt issue, for example, you need to understand the context in which inequality is being discussed. And uh, bag of words models, by destroying the, the word order, they also make it very difficult to grasp uh, context. Uh, and so this was one of the methods issues that, that we encountered and that was, that was very frequent. Um, to understand that debt repayment is actually an instance of wealth inequality discussion, you need to see the context words in which, or that surround uh, debt repayment. Um, and so this led us to search for other methods. And ultimately we arrived at this one, which is called concept mover distance. Uh, so concept mover distance is an open source, uh, it's an open source tool. It's available in the R programming language. Um, uh, the, the developers of it are very active in expanding its functionality right now. Uh, so I, I believe there's gonna be new functionalities added. Um, it was developed by a group of cultural sociologists and it's used to measure uh, engagement at the document level with a pre-specified concept. Um, and it does so by using external pre-trained word embeddings. Uh, so word embeddings, uh, are essentially contain information about the likelihood that different words will appear in the same context. Uh, so words are represented as vectors and those vectors tend to convey useful information about the meaning of words. Uh, and the authors argue that this operationalizes a sort of Wittgensteinian theory of meaning uh, where the meaning of a word uh, can be discerned by looking at the word's neighbors. Um, it's based on this relaxed word mover distance algorithm, um, which I'm 
not totally confident I can explain, <laughs> but uh, the most important part is that it emphasizes this, this, this kind of Wittgensteinian theory of meaning. So more operationally then, the input of the model is a unigram tokenized corpus with document level uh, TF-IDF values and affiliated covariates. So these are state year, but you can also build from that um, you know, regional groupings or, or other metadata. Um, a concept to measure, which can be any n-gram, so it can be any, any word, basically, or, or um, group of words, uh, and then the pre-trained word embeddings. And so we used a, a source of open, or an open sourced um, source for these. It's called FastTex English Word Vectors. It was uh, trained with a recurrent neural network, um, and it was trained on, on the common crawl, which contains like many, many gigabytes of text data uh, and all of the, the content of Wikipedia as well. So you have very rich um, uh, word collocation data from that. And the output of this is a document level measure of concept engagement. So you can say from that, uh, Brazil 2008 uh, engaged with um, wealth inequality at this number, you know, two or 2.5 or something. And so what that allows you to do is uh, it allows you to, to get a more fine grained type of analysis than you could get with a bag of words. Uh, and it allows you to capture graded relationships. So instead of saying, does this speech say Brazil 2008, does it engage with wealth inequality, yes or no? You can say it engages with wealth inequality this much. And so that also allows you to facilitate comparison across other countries and say, uh, you know, Brazil engages with wealth inequality more than uh, Peru in 2008, or even more, wealth inequality is more commonly discussed in the 1970s than it is in the 1990s. Um, so these are some of the advantages you get, I think, from, from using concept mover distance. And so what we used, the first uh, point, this is something that appears in the paper we're, we're working on now, is that uh, we used concept mover distance to discover some rhetorical structures that appear over time. And so, um, we just, so what we did is we came up with a list of concepts that reflected dis different understandings of wealth inequality. Again, with reference, some of these, some of these concepts were order consistent, some of them were order challenging. Uh, and then we measured average engagement with those concepts over time. We selected concepts by reading, uh, close reading and interpreting some, some uh, source documents that embodied these different understandings. It was, a, it was a speech, one of them was for order consistent, was a speech given by Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s. Uh, the sort of in-between of order consistent and order challenging was the Brandt Report in the early 1980s. And then the most order challenging was uh, the new international economic order, which was a, a very, uh, was a more radical approach. Um, and so then we, we kind of uh, pooled these different concepts and the levels of engagement with them together over time. And you can see uh, we've got this figure where um, the order consistent contestation, or sorry, the order challenging contestation in orange is more prevalent in the early 1970s. It increases up until the early 1980s. And then it hits this inflection point where it starts to go down and it decreases over time. And meanwhile, the order consistent contestation is on an upward trajectory. So for a brief moment in the early 1970s, they're both increasing, but for most of the time, they're in, in distinct opposition. And so in a way, this we can see this is a, a collapse of order challenging contestation and a rise of order consistent contestation. And so we use this to argue that a discursive shift took place in the early 1980s that saw a decline in order challenging rhetoric. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, order consistent rhetoric became more prevalent uh, and these discursive trends persist into the present day. And I thought one, I was very excited when I first saw this figure because the, the, the very center point of the graph does appear right after, uh, right after the end of the Cold War. So order consistent and order challenging are, are kind of blunt instruments. Um, and so we wanted to get a more fine grained uh, look as well. So for this, we devised a clustering approach where uh, that was based on relative quantities of engagement with, uh, with our selected concepts. 
And so for this, we came up with six different rhetorical clusters and each state was assigned to a cluster for each year. Um, the first cluster was the liberals and those are the most order consistent. Um, the second, cluster, second and third clusters were hard and soft domesticators. And these were, um, domesticator is a combination of, of order consistent rhetoric plus some acknowledgement for the hardship attendant to inequality. So in a way it's kind of uh, paying lip service to inequality uh, while at the same time asserting a, a very order consistent uh, solution to the issue. Um, the next clusters were hard and soft challengers who are uh, mostly order challenging. Uh, and they are the most likely also to advocate for international wealth redistribution. And then the conservative challengers is the last cluster. And they focus mostly on sovereignty issues uh, and very little discussion of the economy. So again, we assigned each state to one cluster per year and then measured the proportions of cluster membership over time. And so this is a bit more fine grained here, um, but it's, it's, uh, it's similar. So these, um, these two blue clusters here are the soft and hard challengers. And you can see early in the 1970s, they accounted for almost 80% of the total uh, membership of the international system. So most states at, at this point in time were very uh, challenging in their rhetoric. They were very much, um, yeah, that was, it, was the, it was the vast bulk of the, of the international system. And then uh, over time in, into, the, uh, into the 1980s, we see a decline first of hard challengers and then of both hard challengers and soft challengers. And meanwhile, there is a distinct rise in both of the domesticating clusters. Uh, so again, this is, this is um, measurements of, so states are clustered based on their rhetorical profile. Um, and so this domesticating cluster emerges uh, after the mid 1980s and it sticks around for the rest of the time. Uh, there's a, a brief moment where it declines slightly uh, and this is the you can see here, this is the 2008 financial crisis, um, but that was actually a movement towards more uh, liberal clusters, which is again, more order consistent. Um, so really what we see is a great shift towards order consistency over time and a great collapse of order challenging rhetoric uh, over time. Um, so, yeah, again, this is just a, a summary of this. Um, so domesticators really became, a, a, it became the, the most stable feature of, of, uh, of our clustering scheme over time. And again, yeah, the hard challenger and soft challenger clusters, uh, they declined while the domesticator clusters uh, increased. Okay, moving on, um, some strengths and limitations. Uh, uh, so I think that word embedding models really have great promise for facilitating fine-grained discourse analysis uh, that is sensitive to context. Um, this is uh, this is one of the early. I mean, I, I didn't I, I didn't generate a neural network or train a neural network myself, um, but I think that there's a lot of. Uh, but I, I used pre-trained embeddings that somebody else had done so. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of of, of potential for exploration here, um, and I think that. By being able to, to identify the concepts uh, yourself, it's much easier to interpret than, than sort of bag of words machine learning approaches uh, that ultimately lead to you needing to interpret a list of decontextualized words. Um, some of the limitations are that, uh, again, this reliance on external word embeddings can also be problematic. So uh, I essentially the word embeddings themselves are a black box. Um, they're trained from a massive amount of, of online text data, but there's likely to be some, some, um, some biases that are hidden within that. Or some, some um, I mean, it's essentially operating as like a general model of language. And it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a challenge because we don't know exactly what makes those word embeddings. Um, and there's this paper that talks about this issue, the danger of stochastic parrots. Um, and you know, the, potentially some of the biases in online text data 
um, can be harmful as well. Like you can have associations of words that capture stereotypes or negative gender biases. I believe that Ophi has done some work on, on, uh, on, on gender and tweets in the past. Um, and so I think, you know, this is, a, this is a challenge of our study that we have to engage with. At the same time, we're not building a uh, language generating model or we're not building a web application. So we don't have the same danger that like our model will write some evil text and post it online or something like some of the, the new uh, other pre-trained models uh, do now. And so for further research, um, you know, one of, uh, I think, uh, one area that would be interesting would be to replicate this with a different set of word embeddings. And I've, I'm in the process, I'm, I'm nearly completed with the replication data. So if anybody ever wants to try to replicate this with different embeddings, uh, that would be possible. They could just download the code from my, my GitHub. Um, and then also uh, an approach to inductive concept discovery, I think would be a, a really uh, interesting challenge. So given a series of, of texts, how could you discover which concepts are the most uh, salient at a given moment in time? Um, ultimately, we chose concepts uh, through interpretation of text, uh, through, through interpreting um, uh, different, different works on, on wealth inequality. Uh, but if there was an inductive approach that could automatically generate those concepts when given a, a uh, uh, a text corpus, that would be a, a major advantage. Uh, and if anybody wants to talk about that, I have some ideas, but I've, I figured I would spare them for, for this. Um, oh yeah, these are some of the, the concepts that we used. Um, it's a pretty terrible table to look at on Zoom. So if anybody wants to see, I can send the, the paper along as well. Um, and so that's all. Thank you very much for, for your attention. This is my contact information. If you have any questions or um, if you would like to read our draft paper, um, this GitHub address has the replication files if you want to see uh, exactly how I did the coding for this. Um, I don't really tweet much, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a lurker. So I thought I would include that as well. Um, and so that's it. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, this was really great. Uh, thank you. And I think I should just open the discussion. So people, there is nothing in the chat. People should raise their hands. And I see there is raised hands by Johan. So yes, please, Johan. Hi, Johan. Hi, thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, I think one, my first question you have already almost answered, which is, uh, can you give examples of some of the concepts you used for this similarity? So you showed it that, okay. So this is basically like two or three words. Mm -hmm. And so each of these things is then like mapped to the these six clusters, for example, or like you have several of these phrases, which all, uh, you know, there yes. a subset indicates one cluster and another subset in indicates another cluster. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, because I was, I was thinking, um, I had a look at this concept uh, mover distance because I know the paper about the word mover distance. <laughs> so I was curious. <laughs> And obviously, I was thinking, um, have you on your to do list or on your plan to use something that uses actual um, vectors that represent like phrases or whole texts rather than because what you do here is you create uh, a distance based on a sequence of tokens which are mapped to embeddings, right? Right. Right. But when you use more modern uh, approaches based on, for example, transformer language models, mm -hmm. you could use uh, an embedding for a whole phrase or a whole paragraph, really. Which okay. then would m include even more the contextual relevance of your concept, right? Mm -hmm. That so sounds I, like a great idea. <laughs> okay, so I think that we should we should look at this 
Uh, yeah, because I mean, board move distance is so night 2000. Uh, what was it? 19 or something? <laughs> I think it's mid 90s, even. Yeah. But but uh, you know we. So I'm a, I'm ultimately I'm a, I'm studying political science. So I get right. the, I'm a little bit behind the curve on the, on this. But with transform, I mean, also we started this project two years ago, and transformers have recently recently blown up. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. I, we've tried something similar with measuring cos, but this is I'll probably laugh at this too. But with cosine similarities between the whole uh, documents as well. Um, yeah, but there you also don't have actually the sequence information. That what what I think would be really useful in your case is that with anything that is transformer like, uh, like a language language models that are transformer like, you really get embeddings for a whole sequence mm -hmm. and and i mean and this would allow you to um look at more fine-grained utterances or fine-grained similarity to what you express here so for example regulation of transnational corporations there it's important that's the regulation of something right mm -hmm. so and just looking at the sequence of words is often not enough to really capture this so i think that the transformer based uh, similarities would be re really be useful and the other thing uh, is that with transformers you can fine-tune the language model on your own corpus so you can adjust the similarity to the kind of texts you are confronted with and mm -hmm. so you could just you know ru run the whole un uh, corpus um, into the model for pre-training mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. currently your scores all come from Wikipedia and uh, the common crawl which might not be so similar to UN speeches so mm -hmm. you could also include like EU parliament speeches for example to just get that kind of domain into your language model and I think, I think that could in improve your score maybe I think that would be a interesting really, to be honest <laughs> it would be a good it would be a great resource to have a diplomatic uh a pre-trained diplomatic or yes pre-trained diplomatic word embeddings to facilitate that type of research yeah so yeah. that it would not be word embeddings it would be more like sequence embedding so you could okay. run sentences or paragraphs into the model and would get an embedding for that okay i mean you could stand still like if you have a long speech and you create the uh, embeddings for each sentence you could still then use word mover distance to get the overall score for all the sentences in the speech sure. but maybe you are actually even more interested if it's a long speech into the small part that is about the topic you're interested in, and all the other stuff you are not even interested in right yeah on a on a sentence level so sorry, that was a long question. No, that was great. I, I appreciate it. That's a good. I'll, I'll follow up with you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So the next raised hand is Markus Kornprobst. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, Former supervisor. But, thanks a lot for the for the talk. I greatly greatly enjoyed it. So you're going to get three questions uh, from me. They are methodologically much much more pedestrian uh, compared to your hands that you just heard. <laughs> um, the first question is about the graph itself, yeah? So with the two curves, I mean, that is a very, very robust finding. I mean, that's, that's so that there's, so that the one goes up, the one, the one goes down, yeah? Um, I was just wondering, do you have any clues about why this looks like that? So when you, when you look at, at what happens during these, these times or these eras, um, because to some extent, what you what you do is, or what, to some extent, this graph is, is intuitive. Yeah. So uh, so there's the Cold War, and during the Cold War, one would think, okay, so there are these two systems clashing with one another. Uh, one of them probably more challenging the system, and the other one more supporting it. Then comes the um, my phone is ringing. Sorry. Then comes the uh, then comes decolonization. So, uh, so that, that to some extent, still probably 1970s. So, so newly independent states in Africa, late 1950s, 1960s, um, often has much more outspoken about inequality than than what we are seeing now. Eh? 
So that is the intuitive side. The, the non-intuitive side um, is, uh, is this whole discourse about millennium development goals, sustainable development goals, human capabilities approach and all of that. And uh, that I find is a very interesting aspect in, your, in, this, in this graph and in your work because uh, you basically so so because because this this millennium development goals and sustainable development goals they have always been sold as the great departure basically yeah and uh, and so and if I if I if I read uh, your argument correctly then you basically say it's not like that yeah um, I think that that is that is an important that's an important part of your argument. Um, the second, the second one uh, that is a really pedestrian methodological question <laughs> about UN languages. So, um, so some most of the languages. Are, uh, so sorry, most of the speeches are given in English, uh, but there's some in Arabic, in Spanish, in, in Russian, uh, and and in French probably as well. So, so I was just wondering how you how you work around that. And then the third question, which is to some extent an unfair one, because so for for uh, so for an article, this is really this is really I think already uh, uh, very much on, on its way uh, towards an exciting publication. Yeah? Um, but to me, it begs a little bit the question of causality. So how come? Um, and so how come that there is this rhetorical domestication? So if you would make now this, this graph that we have in front of our, for us, the dependent variable, uh, what's the making of it? And then, uh, then it's probably, so, so just looking at it, it's probably an argument about hegemony, I would think, right? Uh, and, then, and, then, and then the rise of, the, of, the, of what's, what's, what's uh, I can very and others would call a liberal world order. And uh, and then another, but that would be a completely different different project. Also about causality would be what this rhetor this rhetorical domestication actually does. So is it is it just words or uh, was it actually productive uh, for better or for worse uh, in, in in certain ways in terms of uh, the international order in terms of foreign policy outcomes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, these are, yeah, these are really important things. Um, so as for the, for the why does this happen? This is uh, actually, so we presented this at, a, at another conference and got similar questions also with the causality question. Uh, so the why does this happen um, and, and how come? Uh, I mean, I would, I would just from, from other readings, I would guess that it's some reaction to the new international economic order. Like Quinn Slobodian has this book, uh, Globalist, where they talk about the real threat posed by the new international economic order. And, and, uh, and you know, in the early 1970s, this was also when uh, commodity prices were, were very high. And, um, you know, the, the turn in this graph is sort of right after the, the Volcker crisis as well. Uh, so it seems like there's some something really important happens in the 1970s. Um, I can say we've not quite excavated yet what what it is specifically, but I think it's a it's a it's a good point because as it stands, our piece is a bit more on the descriptive side rather than on the on the causal side. Um, yeah, with the with the with the MDGs and the SDGs, you know, I think this this domestication point is is capturing something important about that because um, I think what, what you get from the MDGs and the SDGs from a lot of countries is a lot of lip service as well and kind of, um, you know, a lot of socially valuable language or socially desirable language kind of, um, you know, assertion that uh, uh, these are important problems and we, we need to address them but ultimately that we have to take care of economic growth first. And that's sort of the, the baseline condition for it. So it's, it's in some ways it resembles the earlier 1970s rhetoric and its emphasis on inequality and injustice. But what's missing from it is this part of redistribution and the kind of what are the different ways that we're going to, to solve it. And there's not a strong international redistribution element as there, as there were in, more in the 1970s. Um, and my favorite example of this actually is from the 2000, because I've read like, I've read a lot of the speeches now. And um, 
there's a 2017 speech from Justin Trudeau where he's talking about uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And Canada was a late signer to that declaration. And uh, so this was the year after Canada signed on. And basically the whole speech is talking about, you know, how, uh, about how Indigenous peoples have been marginalized and discriminated and have suffered and have been economically dislocated. And we're going to do all of this stuff to bring them back in and, and uh, guarantee governance. Um, but first we have to take care of economic growth. And so it's, it's the, all this long floral speech, but then at the end, he kind of reasserts this thing. First, we have to take care of, of, of economic growth. And that, in the Canadian case, means you know, more uh, extraction of natural resources, often on indigenous lands. Um, so then the UN language question, uh, that's, that's very true. Um, fortunately, the UN also has like a, a lot of translation services. So uh, all, of the, all of the texts that I analyzed were in English, um, but they were official UN translations as well. So I think you can trust that, that quality a bit more than if it was like a, a Google Translate, uh, an automatic uh, translated one. Um, but it would be much more interesting to do this kind of multilingual text analysis. I, I believe that's a much harder technical problem. Uh, okay. Thank you, Marcus. And great to see you too. <laughs> okay, Brigitte uh, has a question. Uh, yeah, actually I have two. Uh, one is, did you look uh, into regions? Uh, so thinking, <laughs> and did you see, if you did, did you see some differences in the arguments or in the curves when you look at regions? Uh, and uh, so if I understood correctly, you looked into the kind of political orientation of the, at that time, uh, leading uh, go so the, the government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, uh, so is there some, yeah, some, some, um, region effect as well, or is there just this uh, political orientation effect? Uh, and then I had my second question is just a small one. You said there are some speeches uh, which are about whatever, like the, the example from uh, Auburn you gave. Uh, so did you, can you kind of quantify it? Uh, how many of those speeches are kind of just something? And is this, uh, is, is this uh, like uh, po politically uh, intended because there are people that want to talk about important things or is this, uh, what, what, what is this uh, from a political science uh, perspective? Sure, um, thank you for that. Uh, so, so with the regions question, we, we were working with regions for almost a year trying to like we were, we did subset for, for regions. We used uh, UN, there's a UN region, uh, there's five regions. It's like West Europe and other group, which is West Europe, uh, North America, Australia, kind of the global North. Uh, there's an Africa region, there's um, Asia Pacific and uh, Grulac, which is like Caribbean and Latin America. Those are the official UN regions. And um, Latin America is the most, coherent region, but otherwise it's very, very, it's very hard to find anything useful from the regions, which was astounding, frankly. Um, but, but so like in the one example is in the 1970s, the, the WEAG group, so West Europe, the Global North group, uh, some of the diversity you could see with like Portugal was, was, uh, had just ended, uh, it had like a, a military dictatorship and it, it was moving into democracy. And so Portugal like was very, very far to the left in their language, very much adopting language that was order challenging and, and redistributional and um, uh, very progressive. But then you have other countries like the US and, and Great Britain that were kind of uh, very uh, on the other side with this order consistent language. Um, and yeah, and in Latin America is the, the most uh, the most coherent, but it's also elevated by a few large outliers. So Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, and well, those those two in particular, Ecuador and Bolivia, uh, have the most um, like 
recently had the most kind of progressive or challenging language. Uh, but their, their levels of engagement were so high that they kind of lifted the average. And then there were others, especially in the Caribbean, who had, uh, you know, who were in the complete opposite, opposite direction. Um, Africa as well, there was, there's a lot of, of heterogeneity, heterogeneity within these regions. So we, we, we really thought that it would, it would be regions that, that cracked it, but we, it's, it's pretty much spread out across, across regions. Um, and so the random speeches, that would, it's a good, it's a good note. And I should include something about that in our, our methods. I think you could probably, you could probably just filter by, by speech length, like the number of words. And if it's like a very small, because the, the Hungary speech about environmental issues was very small. Some of the Russian speeches are very small. Politically, it could be a form of protest. It could be a, a kind of symbol of, uh, you know, we don't value the United Nations, so we don't, we don't respect this institution. But then there are other, other, that's not the only way in which that sentiment could be expressed because you also have like Donald Trump speeches where he's, he's talking about how the UN is a waste of time basically, but it's long-winded. It's not, it's not a brief speech. Um, but but I, I should do that as well to, to find, I should, I should find a way to, to deal with these kind of short one-off speeches that, that are seemingly random. Uh, okay. Uh, so once more, Johan. Yeah, can I ask another question? <laughs> I have another methodology, methodological question. Yes, please. Um, obviously, so because I do all this kind of uh, machine learning, so usually you have to figure out how good is your method working. So, and I'm wondering how can you do this with your approach how can you evaluate actually whether what you get is actually what you want to get so and a related question because that would be then interesting i mean even if it's not evaluation it would be interesting did you look how for example this graph or other analysis you do change if you merely uh, change the set of phrases that you use to describe each of these concepts. I mean, even if you just change a word, does this influence the graph? If you leave out one or add another one, how does that change the graph? I think that would be interesting because from my experience, I have worked with, with uh, word embeddings a lot. Uh, unfortunately, these word embeddings are, you know, sometimes a bit tricky because the 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 way of how well they work um is completely different depending on where in the huge space of space of word embeddings you are so with one phrase it might work well but with the word embeddings you have with another phrase actually what won't work so well because maybe it haven't hasn't seen the phrase in the corpus or whatever so <laughs> I'm interested in how to figure out how well actually this whole approach works. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and and that is, um, I mean, so I haven't systematically done what you said, where I would go through and change specific words with the intention to see if it screws up the model. Um, I've tried hundreds of different concepts and. Um, it wasn't until we did this close reading of the, like where we came up with this concept list from close reading that uh, we had anything that was really, that looked useful or that seemed plausible. And not all the words worked. We started with, or phrases, we started with 21 for each, each um, group. I can check and see uh, and filter if they're actually there. Uh, or if they're just like not appearing in, because you can figure out if they're not in the actual embedding space um, by looking and seeing if there's, well, yeah. These are good questions that I don't have totally satisfactory answers for, but it would be a good idea to try to see if, if playing with the phrases would, would screw up the, the curves of the graph. My, yeah. 
my guess is that these are are legitimate, but that might be motivated reasoning as well. <laughs> I mean, it that that's uh, an ancient problem with it, with all the things that use clustering and topic modeling. Right. And evaluation is rarely done. But there is a certain danger that if you have a lot of parameters to fiddle with, that you just kind of involuntarily adjust the parameters until you see the results you want to see, right? So it would be interesting to kind of objectivize this, of what it's, although it's really hard to do that. I mean, I have no suggestion of how to do this. But at least to get a feeling how big is the variation, I think would be a good start, uh, probably. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do intend to leave. I mean, I have replication uh, files available for this. So if somebody like um, I, I hope to to I'll, I'll look into how to evaluate this and maybe somebody else will evaluate me. And, and By the way, that's, <laughs> that's another uh, advantage of transformer-based language models because they handle out of vocabulary words much better. Okay. Because they don't even have a vocabulary in the classical sense. They use broken up word pieces and a lot of context so they can deal with out of vocabulary much better in, in the most cases. I'm, I'm persuaded that I have to better understand trans transformers. <laughs> Great. Okay, are there any other questions? No. So uh, now we have this problem, this online problem, because it would be really appropriate uh, that we all move downstairs now and head for beer <laughs> and further discussions. This is the shortcoming of being online. Uh, so we have to postpone that. Definitely. You said you might come to Vienna soon, so, uh, I hope so. There, is an, there is an invitation waiting for you. <laughs> Meanwhile, thank you very much for this for this presentation, for this lecture. Uh, I'm really proud that we have you as the the opener for for the series, uh, pointing, namely pointing into directions that first we should definitely follow, but that also show that methods that might be old or simple applied to other topics like uh, political science really can provide results and that enables you uh, to, to claim things that are really not only interesting, but also necessary to claim in order to um, understand the world, world a little bit better. Um, yes, uh, really great. Okay, Robert, do you want to say concluding words? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank so, you all very yeah. much for the, for the opportunity and for all of the, the, the thoughtful comments and the feedback. I have a lot to, a lot to think about. I'll, I'm going to reach out to some of you after as well uh, to, to expand yeah. on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you.